Well, welcome to our fourth week together here in Worship Moments. Hopefully this has been helpful and beneficial for you, both spiritually and relationally, as you watch this every week, whether you're watching it as it debuts at 7 p.m. or, you know, you're watching it later, or, or maybe you're in a car or in bed or whatever. I just appreciate you being here and, and uh, sharing this time with us. I have a couple of announcements First and foremost, don't forget that Wednesday night dinner is happening here. You can sign up on fsuwesley.com. In fact, you need to sign up on fsuwesley.com. The cost is $4, and you can pay it via credit or debit right there. Um, I would just really, really, really encourage you to go ahead and sign up uh, as you are planning out your week and all that sort of thing. It just helps us with some contact tracing. It helps us with knowing how many people are going to be there and all that sort of thing. Also, I've got some exciting news. Next Sunday, my daughter, Dylan, who's about five months old, is going to be baptized. And she's going to be baptized here at at Wesley. Uh, we're going to do a short, private, brief service during the day that we're going to film, and then we are going to play it next week for worship moments. So I just want to invite you to share in that time and that joy in our family's life, but also in the greater Wesley life uh, for Dylan's baptism. So that'll be next Sunday, and you'll be able to watch it right here on worship moments number five. So anyway, uh, I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you're spending this time together, and I want to hand it over to the band because they've got some amazing songs planned.
thank the band for sharing with us tonight so far, and they're going to share with us a little bit later too. Uh, we have been for the last couple of weeks in the book of Acts as we start to develop who we are as a community and as a church, uh, what it means to find our new normal. And uh, last week we talked about Saul and, and his conversion, and we talked about the prophetic word that happens in Acts 2 as the Spirit indwells. I want to read tonight, and we're going to do this kind of in two parts, both this week and next week, uh, specifically because of the baptism of Dylan. I want to talk about what happens here at the very end of Acts 8, and this is the story of Philip and then also the Ethiopian eunuch. So let me read this for us. An angel from the Lord spoke to Philip at noon. Take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jerusalem, where he had come to worship. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Candace. Candace is the title given to the Ethiopian queen. He was reading the prophet Isaiah while sitting in his carriage. The spirit told Philip, approach this carriage and stay with it. Running up to the carriage, Philip heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah, and he asked, Do you really understand what you're reading? The man replied, Without someone to guide me, how could I? Then he invited Philip to climb up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture he was reading. Now, this is from the prophet Isaiah, and this is really interesting because eunuchs appear a few times in, in, our, in our biblical text, and one of the main times is in Isaiah. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, Justin was, justice was taken away from him. Who can tell the story of his descendants? Because his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, about whom does the prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Starting with that passage, Philip proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. I love the way Eugene Peterson writes it. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, writes, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what would keep me from being baptized? And he ordered the carriage to halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water where Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Lord's Spirit suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. We do not castrate people, which is is how we would describe a eunuch, is, is a male who has been castrated. We don't do that in today's modern world, but it was done in the past a lot, and usually for them to serve some sort of role. They were used in some sort of subservient role or in some sort of role that would be task-oriented. They weren't necessarily an official part of, of equality among a people. I mean, these were people who were, who were set aside for a certain task, and their body bodies were mutilated in order to do that. And there's some different scholarship about whether, you know, was this eunuch Jewish? Was he a Gentile? Who knows? We don't really know all of the details here. But there is something significant here, and it stands as important for us here at the Wesley Foundation as we decide who we're going to be. The eunuch, who wasn't a part of a society who could be included, who could be welcomed, The eunuch is reading the prophet Isaiah. He's learning about Jesus, which Philip then preaches to him. And at that point, he says, then what would stop me from being baptized? One of the things that I said from the outset, and this is a a rich part of Wesley's history. This is a rich part of who Wesley has been for so long. One of the most important things to me as we start to develop who we are as a church is that we are going to be fully inclusive and welcoming to all people. Now, let me just tell you that when we start welcoming, a lot of times if we're the ones who have felt on the outside or we felt less important or something like that, we're really excited about welcoming. But then there are still others in our midst or, or among us on our campus especially who are people who are not welcome who are people that are different than us. And so as we start to develop who we are as a people, the one thing we must be is radically inclusive. And you're going to find lots of churches. You're going to find a lot of United Methodists, to be honest. You're going to find a lot of people who just aren't 
You know, they see the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the fact that Jesus came to die for our sins as, as somewhat exclusive to only those who would hold up to the moral codes that they held up to. And here's what I'm saying is for us as a church, as a people, we are going to be radically inclusive because we believe even the eunuchs among us, the people who are not included, the people who are just supposed to serve some other role according to society or whatever, anybody among us is well Welcome here, and the gospel is for them too. What happens with the eunuch is that he repents of his sin after he's read the scriptures, after Jesus has been preached to him, and then he says, What would stop me from being baptized into this new truth? And then they stop and they do it. There's no other dialogue, there's no other conversation. They stop and they do it. One of the things I love about the college campus is that, uh, and, and typically this isn't as true in a local church, because if you go to a local church, you typically go to a church with people that look and think like you. But what happens on a college campus, and sometimes in a ministry and sometimes not, sometimes it's just a broader campus, is that there are people from every walk of life across our campus. Every sexual identity, every gender identity, every political identity, and as the Wesley Foundation, if we're going to be radically inclusive, which we are, we're going to welcome all of those people into this space. We're going to welcome all of those people into this community should they want to be a part. I want you to think over the next week or so about people in your life that you need to radically include. I'm guilty as just as much as anybody else of sticking inside of my echo chamber or my bubble. And for being honest, between now and November, it's going to get way worse than that here. But I want you to think of somebody in your life who you need to include. If you're somebody who has struggled with including people who, who are, are different or think different than you, Choose some of those people in your life, and how can you include them? How can you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them? And if you're somebody who's often felt excluded, if you're somebody who's often felt like, man, maybe this isn't all for me, I want to tell you that this is for you. It is going to be okay. It is going to get better. And this place, this place that we're all a part of, this community that we're all a part of, this is a place for you. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, we love you. God loves you. Amen.
you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak a hundred billion failures disappear your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part designed in a work of art called you gladly choose surrender so will I I can see your heart a billion different ways every precious one a child you died to save if you gave your life to love them so will I again a hundred billion times but what measure could amount to your desire you're the one who never leaves the one behind <laughs>